Um, we're very, very, uh, very uh, appreciate um, Doug being here today. So obviously, 2022, Larry gets an award. <laughs> 2022 has, um, has, has seen much public debate about equity market structure, and obviously our next speaker here has been front and center of those conversations. Uh, Doug Sifu is the CEO of Virtu Financial and was a co-founder of Virtu. Uh, previously, Doug was a partner at the international law firm Paul Weiss, where among other things, he was co-head of the private equity group. Doug serves on, on boards of several associations, and has been recognized for his achievements by Cranes and Financial Technology Report. Uh, interviewing uh, Doug is Rich Repetto, is a managing director and senior research analyst at Piper Sandler. Uh, previously, Rich was a principal of Sandler O'Neill. Uh, his research coverage in included uh, e-brokerages, execution venues, and e-specialty finance sector. So I'm going to turn over to Rich, and then when Doug is done, we're going to have Larry come up. We'll have a little SDA family moment, and then we'll, then we'll uh, have everybody spill outside. Okay? Thank you. So uh, I'm going to go by the instructions. Uh -uh. And the instructions say I'm supposed to give a preamble referencing Chairman Gensler's comments. I don't even know what preamble means. Yeah. <laughs> that goes before the amble. <laughs> I'll do a ramble. How's that? Yeah. So uh, last year I was supposed to interview Doug, uh, but I unfortunately couldn't make it because yeah. of health issues. Yep. Uh, uh, my good friend Tim Mahoney did, but I think Tim probably got two words in for 98 of yours because you were so, you had such conviction. I was about fired the, up. You yeah. were fired up. And we, we hope you're fired I'm up. I'm calmer today. <laughs> I, we don't want to see, com we, right. want, we, want, we want to see Doug's. Raise your hand if you want crazy Doug. <laughs> All right, fuck it, let's <laughs> go. All right, let's go. I want It's crazy. Larry's bar mitzvah, we're gonna have some fun. <laughs> we Simon Tov and Mazel Tov to Larry. Larry's right. going to remember us so we can stay over his place in yeah. the Cape. I don't even know if Larry Jewish. Is Larry Jewish? I don't know. I think he is. He must be. Yeah. Yeah. He has a place in the Cape. We want to spend the weekend does. there with him. There's so, a lot of Jews in the Cape, but anyhow, good to see you, Larry. So, so m let me start with my ramble, not preamble. My ramble says yeah. that on June 8th, uh, Chairman Gensler gave I a speech. I remember it. It's a at, day that will live in infamy. At yeah. a certain conference. I don't know whose conference that was. Yep. Uh, the best conference... Now, now, Jimmy's going to, in the first six months of the year, this is the best conference in the last six months of the year. Who thinks Rich's talking too much already? Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand. All right. I'm trying to make we up. We've got a question now. Let's go, Richie. Come on. They didn't start I'm going to have lost right, time. Ahead, I'm sure you'll make I'm up kidding. soon. I'm kidding. I'm messing around. Go ahead. So anyway, Chairman Gensler did lay out. Uh, he did. In his speech. Chair. At my, chair. At, not chairman. Excuse chair. Me, chair it's Gensler chair, yeah. at, a, at my conference laid out his plans for retail equity market structure. It consisted of six points. Yep. And I'm not going to go through all six points, but okay. you know them. We'll discuss some of the points. I do. Uh, but if you were actually paying it, you know, had followed him, uh, I, it wasn't two newer things, but he carried more force and, he, and probably took it to a little bit more of a, an extreme, if it's fair to say. Sure. <laughs> so anyway, let me get into some of the content and, okay. how, and, and let you do the talking. So we'll switch this over to you. So first was uh, one of the big topics, one of the big six was payment for order flow. Yep. And let me give you a couple of quotes, and I'm trying to be Switzerland here, be neutral, but he did say 90, per, 90 plus percent of retail marketable orders are routed to small, a small concentrated group of wholesalers that pay for this retail market order flow. False. That's false. It's factually inaccurate. Could we continue? Okay. Yeah. But I'm, so, I mean, that's an example. Yeah. I'm going to cut you off because yes, I, I can't sit still yes. for that long. So, I mean, that's... That's just not a, that's not a correct statement, right? Because there are, and we got a lot of clients in the room, but you know, there's a big shop up in Boston. There's one in Valley, Valley Forge, I guess it is, Pennsylvania, Vanguard, right? That doesn't take payment for flow. So if you do the math, and we've done the math, the number is substantially less than 90%. Schwab, there's 250 retail brokers, platforms, whatever you want to call it, that we have as clients, and so do a lot of the other wholesalers. Uh, about 10, 11, or 12 of them, I forgot exactly, take a rebate. Now, obviously, Robinhood and Schwab are very large, right? So in terms of orders, it's a substantial amount. But there's another, you know, so 95% of the marketplace doesn't take it. So what Gensler has done, right, which is part of his, the way that he frames things, which has kind of got me wound up, as you can tell, over the last couple of years, is that he conflates issues and, I'll say in that instance, misstates facts to try to draw a conclusion about a market structure that, frankly, is just not supported by the facts. So I'm a little bit the fact police here. 
which is to say that 95% of the retail brokers don't take a rebate. It's no different. It's not more pernicious than any other rebate paid by an exchange in any other marketplace in the world. We just have a shitty naming convention. We need a marketing consultant, high frequency trading, dark pools, payment for order flow. If we called it a rebate, it sounds a lot less pernicious, right? But more importantly, it's got nothing to do, nothing to do with how those retail brokers route their orders. It's fixed. They're not auctioning it off to the highest bidder. They're not abrogating their best execution obligations because they're taking a rebate. It is subsidizing the costs that they would otherwise have to incur in order to provide their service, which they do, most of them now do, at zero commission. Right? So that's what kind of annoyed me, and that's what, you know, to wave my American flag for a second, like we have a fantastic marketplace here in the United States. We have a retail ecosystem that enables every American retail investor, at, if they want zero commission, to obtain essentially unlimited, if you will, with regard to retail size in close to 10,000 Reg NMS listed names and ETFs, right? instantaneously at a price that is at or better than what any other institution can get in the United States. That is a pretty amazing system. We're in 49 other countries around the world, and I can tell you from our experience, people may disagree with this, and we're in a lot of, obviously, major markets where there's significant retail participation. There isn't a system like that in the world. So by casting aspersions and innuendos and using facts that, frankly, are just wrong and suggesting somehow that there's this conflict like, he, like we discovered the Rosetta Stone in the sand. It's been around for 30 years, this rebate, this payment for order flow. Right? It's kind of how the ecosystem developed. There's regulation that the SEC has promulgated around payment for order flow. It's not like something new, right? like they discovered you know, fire and they bring it to the caveman. And that, that's sort of what irritates me about the, the entire debate around this. I'm, I'm all about having an open, honest, and transparent, and data-driven debate on these topics. But when you, you know, just insert a political view and use <coughs> facts in a way to make that point that are just not, they're just not supported by facts and data, Rich. And that's really where I, where I came at. And that's really Absolutely. like yep. why I think that particular topic, you know, it gets all the headlines, it gets all the news, and it's kind of now shifting into like wholesaling and auctions. We'll get into all that stuff. But when it comes down to payment for affordable, look, it's an expensive virtue. <coughs> and I've said this publicly before, and I'll say it again. We're paying it, right? So it's probably not in our best interest you know, if it went away, my guess is we'd probably make more money as a firm. But obviously, we're a client-driven firm, and I do think that it has enabled and driven a lot of competition and enabled a lot of great new entrants to come into the market. Now, you know, I know Webull's here, and there's other firms that didn't exist, I don't know, Steve, five, six, seven years ago, right? Steve K, doing a little bit of work today, rare day. Uh, <laughs> so I got to abuse Steve K at everything I go to. It's kind of like a tradition. So anyhow, so that, that's where I got sort of high and mighty about it. Like, I'm very, very proud, and I'm new to the industry, right? I started Virtu in, in 2008, so a lot, everybody in this room that's been here a lot longer than I have, and you guys really built this incredible ecosystem. It's incredibly competitive, and a lot of benefits have inured to the end users, right? Like, I can go through all the statistics on how much price improvement, all that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, immediacy around execution at zero commission in 10,000 effing names at a size that you want at a price that's at or better than an institutional investor. Period, end of story. What the hell are we talking about? Like, why are we taking this giant anvil and trying to, like, as Dan Gallagher said, hit this theoretical nail? This, you know, I, I don't really get what the problem is. So, uh, <clears throat> I got one more follow-up on How was that? You that didn't even ask a question, so. I, I, I didn't. You just, I don't think I we really have this. to ask questions. Yeah. I, I do want to just incentivize you. Crit, yeah. uh, Commissioner Pierce just said, is totally, she said, and I quote, Purse. she Purse. said it was Purse. very healthy. Purse. Commissioner Pierce, yeah. Commissioner Purse. That it looks like said, Pierce, but it's Purse. Yeah. Purse. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Commissioner. She said it was very, this, just this afternoon, she yeah. said it was very healthy that you keep up the rhetoric and challenge Me? the regulators. That uh, she says uh, is a healthy environment. So don't, don't hold back if you were. Yeah, look, I'm not. Uh, back. Yeah, people are like, oh, you know, he's the regulator. I, I, look, I respect, you know, we're highly, re I'm a lawyer by training. Like, I did this for a living for 18 years at Paul Weiss. We, we, I run a highly regulated business. We're registered every place in the world. I've appeared before the MAS in Singapore and the FSA in Japan. We registered there as a high-speed trading firm. We're up in Canada. We're regulated by the CBI in Ireland. I'm not like some, you know, anti-government, you know, anti-regulator 
kind of uh, a person, and virtue certainly does not you know, conduct itself in that manner. We're very proud of the fact that we engage with regulators all around the world. Um, but I want to do it in a fair way, right, without like the, the injection of, and I know I'm in Washington, so this is a naive thing for me to say, without the injection of politics. Really what this is all about, Rich, is, and, and we've talked about it before, and I've said it before, you know, in Washington, don't let a, a crisis go to waste, right? So when the House Financial Service, I knew we were in trouble. This was like when I was watching TV on March 31st, 2014, Virtue's about to go public, 60 Minutes is doing its story on Flash Boys, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. We're IEX's biggest customer. We pay these lovely people, I was going to use a bad word, $200,000 a month in commissions. Like, we're 25% of their market. This is going to make Virtue look great. And as soon as Steve Croft opened up his stupid mouth and started talking, I said, all right, we're fucked. Right? So, uh, you know, we, we better start like, I shouldn't have said fucked. We, are, we have issues. Right, so, you know, how did we respond to that? We responded to that with, with facts and with data and being transparent with regulators and with a lot of great folks in this room. My friends at T-Row, I know Mets here, you know, they were kind enough to come into Virtu and we explained what it is we did. This is no different. This situation is no different. This discussion around payment for order flow has been going on for 30 years. The criticism around this segmented marketplace and lack of competition and Citadel and Virtu and all this kind of other nonsense People have been talking about it for a long time. Let's engage in the debate, but let's do it in a non-political, non-shitty way, using facts and data that are empirically there. Right? My friends at Schwab did an amazing white paper a couple, three, four, five weeks ago. I don't remember exactly when. It's on their website. Okay? They have a view of the market and a history in this marketplace. I mean, they basically created this market, right? In part with some other great folks. And so their conclusion was, this marketplace really inures ultimately to their customers. Gensler talks about he's got 330, you know, Americans he's got to protect. Well, Schwab's got, I don't know, 50 million accounts or something like that. Ovi, am I directionally correct? Yeah, shake your head, okay. So, you know, they're doing the right thing by their customers, and their conclusion was that the, the ecosystem and the market structure works exceptionally well for their clients, right? And to the tune, they estimate, and this is based on empirical data over the last 20 years, extrapolating out over the next 10 years, what it's going to save retail investors, it's $120 billion. Am I right, Ovi? Roughly, right? That's what the report said. Everyone go read it. That's the hurdle that my friends at the SEC have to overcome. If somebody in Washington or some other place has a system that works better, that can drive that much benefit to retail investors in this country, I'd love to see it. It doesn't exist. It does not exist. Right? And so if you're going to try to overturn 30 years of market structure embedded in the regulatory environment, right, with all kinds of facts and data behind it. That's the hurdle that you got to get over. And certainly, I used to be a lawyer. That's what the Administrative Procedures Act says as well, right? So if you're going to go do this, otherwise, why are we wasting time on this? There's so many other things we could be talking about in this marketplace, but we're wasting time on this. Uh, amen. Um, Can I get an amen? I'm a Switzerland. I can't say it. Okay. <laughs> But I, I, I do, we, we already went, you blew right through my I know. next I know question. I know, I do that, I go. Somehow that happens. Yeah, uh, sorry. But I do, sorry. I, I, I really think the point here, uh, and I will give media credit, because I know our, our friend Alex is in the, in the crowd. Oh, there's media here? Uh, Joking. I think so. <laughs> Nobody quote me, that was on background. <laughs> Did they sign it? <laughs> they do sign stuff right now. I'm kidding. But the media- Write whatever you want. What, what, what are they going to do? The, the, the media did report that- What are they going to do to me? We're on to the next question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the media did report that the ban on payment for order flow was, you know, according yeah. to them, was off the table. And, and I guess, just from a human yeah, standpoint, I, I wanted to, what, did, what was your first reaction when you read that? Did you know it was coming? No. Do you think, do you know why, or have a, what was your feeling why that happened? And have you had any discussions, you know, with the SEC? Yeah, yeah we, have, we have plenty of discussions. Look, yeah. I mean, the, the professional staff with the SEC, folks that have been here for 10, 20, in some cases 30 years, are incredibly talented. We've dealt with them for an awfully long time. I'm not going to name names. You all know who they are. You know, they get the marketplace. They want to do the right thing. They're very judicious. They work hard. They're incredibly engaging and interactive with us. And they want us to help them supply data. Like in prior administrations, the chair, you know, Clayton used to call up when markets went crazy and he'd be like, listen, I want to make sure I understand this. You know, do you have any data to support like what happened in like when the VIX went crazy or when crude, 
you know, went negative and things like that, right? Nothing like, you know, inappropriate, whatever it was. We have tools and we have a view on the marketplace, and I'm sure he called six, seven, eight, ten other market participants. That's how it should work, a good, healthy back and forth. And certainly, we continue to engage with that, you know, uh, with, with the SEC, Rich. But at the end of the day, why do I think, you know, I, you'd have to ask the reporter. I know it was Bloomberg put it out. You know, I, I talked to the reporter. I'm sure she has her sources yeah. and she has a good basis for putting it out. It really comes down to the fact that, you know, this is a conflict getting paid a rebate from a wholesaler to 10 retail brokers. It's really just not that big of a deal, right? It has been the case for 30 years. There are SEC rules that govern how that is disclosed. So again, it's not like they unearth some practice in the industry that, oh my God, there's this conflict, right? We have a very large institutional business. We have thousands of institutional clients that we route orders for. They pay us a commission. In the US equities market, if we send that order to an exchange and remove liquidity, you know, our cost of goods sold can be 60% of the commission. If we send it to an inverted venue, we actually make money, right? So we have a conflict as an institutional broker, right? Everyone gets that. It's a conflict. How do we deal with it? Well, we're transparent with our clients. We act in their best interests, right? We don't ban rebates across an industry because there's a conflict. You know, you have a conflict as an institution. You cover Virtu. You actually say nice things about us. So if we were to sell stock, we'd probably go to you. Some other banks have a hold. There's a stupid bank that starts with an M and second word is an S uh, <laughs> that says that they should sell Virtu right now. If I went to that bank in New York and said, listen, we want to raise two, three hundred million dollars. Can you sell equity for us? You think they would say no? Does anyone think they would say no? Of course they wouldn't. They have a conflict. Their analyst says that you should sell stock. Their ECM desk is going to go tell a hundred hedge funds that they should buy our stock. That's a conflict. Does Morgan Stanley, oh, I said it, not put out research? <laughs> of course they do, right? They disclose it. There are rules about it. They're transparent around it. There are conflicts all around the place in financial services. I used to be a lawyer. That's how you deal with conflicts. You disclose them, make sure clients understand them, and act in the best interest of your client ultimately, right? So that's why his position is completely untenable, right? So I don't know for a fact that he's pulled it off the table, whatever that means. I have no idea. He's not telling me his inner thoughts on these things, right? So if it is that is the case, terrific. I, I actually would like, if they put out a proposal trying to ban payment for I'd like to see the economic analysis on it, right? Some academicians <coughs> put out a study that said, there is no correlation between firms that receive payment for order flow and execution quality. If anything, it's a reverse correlation. Is that the right way? Reverse correlation? Yeah. So, uncorrelated. Yeah, it's uncorrelated, right? There you go. So, <laughs> I'm not the smartest guy. I'm not a math guy, <laughs> liberal arts guy. So, uh, look, at the end of the day, it, it, it was, to me, it was just a complete red herring. Right? It was a complete red herring. He was conflating the issues of payment for order flow and wholesaling. He did it initially, and we called him out on it, and it's just, to me, it makes no sense. Makes no sense. Yeah. Your guy sling, signaling to me too. Now we we need to get to the next topic. Okay, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I Jimmy think, said I had to liven it up last. <laughs> it was kind of dead in the room, right? Am I doing I, all, right? I, all right? I think we know how you stand on payment for order So another now look. I mean, whatever. Another topic that's been discussed uh, here. We already. run a client business. Clients like it, so you know what are you going to do? I, I right. I think they understand where you're coming there from. There you now. go. So another topic that's already been talked about today is yep. the, the price increments. Uh, and yep. Let me give a couple quotes. Uh, this is from Chair Gensler. Right now, there isn't a level playing field among different parts of the market. Today, we lack a level, level playing field amongst yeah. the different trading venues. So I guess, Doug, what, is, is this uh, a valid analogy? That are, are, uh, are there unique roles that different participants play in the market? Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. I mean, I, I have some sympathy to this point of view, but it really is like, you know, like apples and like watermelons. It's not even apples and oranges. One's a like, like, I mean, exchanges have a very different role in the marketplace than wholesalers do. Obviously, they've got limitations on liability. You know, they've got market data. They have, it's a whole different business model. We're, we're, we're conducting a very, very different business. I, I get the point, and, and exchanges can compete today. There's nothing, no one's holding a gun to the 250 retail clients that we have, and, and there's no long-term contracts. It's a mouse-click business. If we F up, they can route away tomorrow or instantaneously, okay? There's seven, eight, nine, ten different competitors. 
you know, Jane Street's come in, Hudson River's come in. These are all great firms, you know, Susquehanna, Two Sigma, Virtu, Citadel, I probably forgot somebody, UBS, right? So there's a lot of different choices, Wolverine, there's a lot of different choices in the marketplace. And uh, so at, at the end of the day, we have to perform, Rich. We have to perform. And so they can send orders to exchanges today. There are retail liquidity programs. You can execute in a national securities exchange in subpenny increments. You can execute, obviously, in, I don't even know how many ATSs there are these days, 40, 50 ATSs, otherwise known as dark pools, in subpenny increments. The, all the brokers we have are you know, entitled to route orders anywhere they want. They choose to route orders to wholesalers when they're marketable orders. Non-marketable limit orders, by the way, by rule, need to be posted on a national securities exchange. But they choose to route orders to us, not because of a rebate, but because we're providing a service. And what's the service? They've outsourced to us this hassle of, of investing hundreds of millions of dollars, right, to have you know, uh, nanosecond, microsecond execution capabilities across 17 different national securities exchanges. That's a very expensive proposition, right? We provide really good customer service and kind of, my compliance guy's not in the room, a guaranteed execution, right? We do. If we screw up, we make good. There's no limitation on liability. You all remember what happened in Facebook. Bob Greifeld, God rest his soul, uh, now my chairman. Uh, he's still alive, I'm joking. Yeah. Uh, Bob, if you're listening, I apologize. He, he's only uh, your chairman. That's yeah, all. he's only my chairman. <laughs> um, you know, so, so it's a customer service. And, and then, of course, we're providing price improvement. Right? So we're price improving, you know, 90 plus percent of those orders in a way, right, which we're putting good capital at risk and we're taking the risk with respect to doing that. Right? So we quote all the time in retail liquidity programs. Right? We would love, as I've said publicly before, we're internalizing roughly 70 percent of the marketable orders we get. On those other 30 percent, if it's a rebate order, we still owe the rebate and we still owe price improvement to the broker. We have to hit our targets with respect to those brokers, otherwise we're going to lose flow to Citadel, et cetera, right? the firms that we're competing with. So in those instances where we choose not to internalize it, what do we do? We try to source price improved liquidity either from a broker dealer partner or from an exchange or from an ATS, and 82% of the time we fail. Why? Because it's really, really difficult to trade in subpenny increments in a fully disclosed, robust way in 10,000 instruments. If, you, if you're not doing that in a segmented, bespoke, bilateral relationship way, and you're doing it in an open marketplace, you're going to get run over all the time and you're not going to be in business that long, Rich. That's why the system works. That was the genius of these folks that created this ecosystem 30 plus years ago. They realized that they had an asset, which were these smaller, non-market moving, tend to be more correlated, not always, uh, orders, that there was some value to them. It was expensive to send them to an exchange, right? And you could get a better customer service if you created this thing called the wholesale. That was the Knights of the Round Table, Knight Capital, which we were fortunate enough to acquire in 2017. So I went around the horn, did history. I don't even remember what the question was, but <laughs> this is I why remember I the question. Now, getting back to subpenny increments. The CBOE put out a study. There are some tick constrained names, right? It was a very logical study to me. Some people may differ. I think they had like 67 names where there was a significant amount of executions at the midpoint, and there was a lot of Bids and offers, obviously, you know, at the penny touch. So I could see a world where you have exchanges have the ability to quote in, in halves or some increment like that. My friends on the buy side don't want tenths of a penny, right? Because they want to be able to, to remove suffi sufficient liquidity and forget about quote fading if you have tenths of a penny, that kind of thing. So giving exchanges the opportunity, right, to have sub penny quotes makes sense to me. Would I do it in 10,000 names? Of course not. I don't think it makes a lot of sense. You just create a lot more noise without a real benefit to the marketplace. But at the end of the day, really, the reason the brokers are using the various wholesalers is not because we can execute in subpennies. That's another red herring, right? It's not, you know, because there's not a level playing field. It's because we provide a service, a service that the exchanges just can't provide. And it's not because they're not capable, and they're not good people, whatever it is. They're, they're running a different business. That's the thing that Gensler is just, again, conflating. It doesn't get. Either he doesn't get it or he doesn't want to get it. Right? It's a different business model. So it's not fair to say that it's not a, a level playing field because we're, different, we're in different businesses. We are. We complement each other, but we're in different businesses. I have a question. Is, is conflating? Is that, could you I love me? that word. I, I, I love that word, yeah. 
Could you give us a definition? Pernicious, I like. <laughs> and flighting is like, you know, I really, it's like he, he, he brought up payment for order flow, but he really wanted to talk about wholesaling, right? So you're throwing out a red herring and you're conflating payment for order flow with an entire ecosystem market structure of wholesaling, right? It, one is not the same as the other, Rich. Uh, right? I, it's an intentional con conflagration. That's a fire. I know that. <laughs> intentional conflation, right? Because it serves a purpose, right? It gets your attention. If he just went on TV and said, oh, wholesaling is a bad thing, you know, it wouldn't be that interesting. John Stewart would not be wanting to have him on a podcast. When you talk about payment for order flow and conflicts, everyone's like, oh my God, the hair's on fire. And I really do. I want to get back to the point because stupidly I'm on social media and you see some of these comments on Twitter about retail investors talking about like the evils of payment for order flow and manipulation happening in dark pools. And I want to like, you know, reach out to these people and say, listen, you, brother, you got it all wrong. <clears throat> you got it all wrong. You just, you're not understanding how the marketplace works. And so I don't think we're doing a benefit, again, to get back on my high horse. I don't think you're doing a benefit to those folks and to the US e you know, equity ecosystem by calling into question things that are just you know, factually different or can be substantiated with real data. Let's have an open debate. Let's not politicize. Let's not politicize the US equity market structure. That's what has happened, unfortunately, in the last two years. Yeah. A lot of things have been politicized. Yeah. This should not be politicized, in my yeah. humble opinion. I, I have to admit, Doug, I set you up. I actually Googled, anybody? You Google conflation. I Googled conflation. It's okay. actually mixing up two issues and combining it to come up with the wrong conclusion yeah, from well, those two issues. So it, it, there you go. I've heard Doug definition. say conflation a number of times. I thought it was something like a. I was a good SAT verbal something. guy a long time ago, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, there is a point that I do want to <coughs> highlight here. Yep. The, when you talk about trade, there's a different, the difference, could you explain the difference between trading increments and quoting increments? Because I think that gets a little confusing. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the point I just had to make, which is like right now, every exchange and every dark pool and every wholesaler can trade in subpenny prices in any name that they want. Okay? Period, end of story. So if Gensler says something that you know, intimates that that's not the case, it's just not factually correct. Okay, so the retail liquidity programs, I don't know, are they at midpoint? I think they're at midpoint. We trade, they're at tens? Andrew said they're at tens. Okay, I apologize. Right, so they have flexibility to do that. Great. We trade there. We would love, I, I have tongue in cheek said, people, please trade in IEX midpoint, go to New York midpoint, because when we're routing those marketable orders, we would love to get price approved liquidity. Do us a favor, please quote there, okay, or please execute there. Um, by rule, though, you can't display a subpenny. Yeah. Price, so there's no quoting, right? So that's really, that would be the leveling of the playing field. And again, as I indicated, um, we're not against that. I think my friends at Citadel put out a study, a report on that, which was very, very, uh, Berman did it, right? So it had to be good. Uh, it was a great study that they put out. And so I, I read it, and their conclusions seemed incredibly reasonable. And again, data-driven. Yeah, he, he said that basically quoting, in you know, a lot of times, the, the sub-penny, that quotes aren't constrained by penny, yeah. penny uh, increments. Yeah. Let, let's move on to try to get on to another couple topics Oof. before yeah. we, before we uh, roll down this hill too far. The, uh, the, this is going to be, I know, an emotional topic, but auctions. Do, do, do so, I look I mean, emotional? I'm yeah, emotional. exactly. Let me read what Passionate, you Passionate, but not Se emotional. Segmentation means that institutional vets, investors such as pension funds don't get to interact directly with, that, yeah. with order flow. Price improvement without competition, though, isn't necessarily the best price improvement. So he, he's referring to it and uh, sort of, I don't think it, was, it wasn't a specific plan, yeah. but he referred to these uh, order by order competitions or auctions. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. You know, I, I think it, look, I mean, I, I get it, and I've had this discussion with them, and I, I think they ignore sort of the fundamental structure that the retail brokers, I give them a lot of credit, kind of came up with, which is like, you know, really in a perfect world, do we really want to be two-sided in 10,000 reg NMS names and ETFs? Probably not, right? It's a huge operational hassle. Um, the long tail of them, you know, are kind of marginally profitable individually. You know, maybe we make 10 bucks here, that kind of thing. It takes a lot of time, energy, uh, server time, and a lot of operational discipline to manage all of that, right? But it's, you know, we, we can't pick and choose. So the deal we have with all of our retail brokers is if it's a reg NMS listed name and you get a client order and you want to send it to us, you do, right? And we're going to fill it. 
either, as I said, either internalizing it or sourcing liquidity and acting as a riskless principal and sending it back to you, right? So they've outsourced that service to us, okay? My friends at the SEC, I think, are ignoring the benefits, if you will, of all of that. I don't think that they have bought into the concept that that is a real value that we are providing, that not only are we providing instantaneous execution, but a lot of the times, right, 55% of the time, there is not enough size at the, at the NBBO, right, to satisfy that order because it's it, a, a stock, frankly, that people just don't quote and aren't that interested in. So not only are we providing, we and all the other wholesalers, and we put this in our report, and Schwab talks about it in, in depth, so you should go read it. Not only are we providing price improvement, but we're providing size improvement. So we're acting as if, and I said this on TV, and then the Twitter people went crazy, as if there's infinite size at the MBBO. There's not. They, I said, you know, it's like a liquidity fairy, and then someone did a meme of me as a fairy, and I would think, I hope I wouldn't look like, I've never dressed as a fairy, but I would hope I'd look thinner than what they did in the meme. It wasn't a very flattering picture. It was kind of funny, so you should go look at it. <laughs> I'm all about self-deprecation. Anyhow, so like size improvement is a real thing, right? There are some people at the SEC that just don't believe it or don't buy it. I don't know why. To me, it's a very academic conclusion that they're reaching. I think there's data out there that we put out there initially that Schwab validated, and Schwab looks at all the wholesales, and they did a great job. So, you know, people have complained to me over the years about these small and mid-cap names, right? Thinly traded stocks. Remember that was like an issue five, six, seven years ago at STA? Well, all you would do is you would exacerbate, if you had an auction environment, we wouldn't provide size you know, the way that we do at the long tail. Why would we? Right? We're taking incremental risk, Rich, right? So we're not going to do that. So who's going to do that? You know, this mythical liquidity fairy, that's what I said on TV. Right? So at the end of the day, all that means is that those names will have wider bid offers, and you all know what that means, that if they want to go raise capital and they're a small mid-cap company, it's going to cost them more. They're going to call their congressman. The congressman is going to call the SEC, and everyone's going to be unhappy. So why would you do that? For what benefit? I don't know. Again, getting back to it, there's not a single piece of data out there that demonstrates that putting these orders into an auction would be a superior result in the existing ecosystem. So the notion that you're going to go on a lark, throw out 30 years of market structure, and say to 250 institutions, 240 of which don't take a rebate, we know better than you do. We know better. We're in Washington, right? We don't trade. Some of us have never worked in the industry, but we know better than you do big firm up in Boston that doesn't take a rebate that, it, that basically started this industry and has billions of dollars to invest in technology. I mean, I'm laughing because it's just, you know, to me, it's like almost un-American, right? Give people choices. If you don't want to pay payment for order flow, go to a broker that doesn't take it. If you don't want your order sent to a wholesaler, there are brokers that don't send all orders to wholesalers. I forgot what their names are because we don't do business with them. You're going to get a worse execution, but it's America. If that's what you want, go do that. I don't care. Right? If you think auctions are great, then people in this room or elsewhere should start auctions, and brokers have a best execution obligation. If the execution quality is better in an auction environment, then all of these firms will be obligated to send some or a vast preponderance of their orders there. They won't, because it won't be, but allow them to compete. Fine, I don't care. There are, I, somebody has an auction today. I forgot what it's called. PDQ. Right, they have an auction today. Is that, do they have any market share? Andrew's shaking his head no. Right? I don't want to insult PDQ. I'm sure it's a wonderful group of people. We probably trade there a little bit, right? We do. We, we connect. Uh, but the marketplace speaks. Right, the marketplace speaks. All of these choices are out there today. What are we doing? Why would we mandate that these really you know, intelligent, successful, well-funded, technologically enabled retail brokers, all of a sudden, they don't know anymore that they have to, orders have to be sent to these auctions. I mean, to me, it's just like, it's cuckoo. What are we talking about this for? It's not a chance in the world <clears throat> That that would that would survive a legal challenge either, Rich. Not a chance. Just the not the. It, I'll it, take it on a contingency. There you go. I'm the, not a lawyer uh, anymore. In your second job, yeah. the uh, just some of the numbers that Schwab did put out: 3.4 billion in size improvement. You had talked about 2 billion. Yeah, well, that was just Vert two, right? Just yeah. Vert two. Yeah. They put out 3.4. And size improvement is that they honor the full order 
at, at that, whether it's 100 shares at the NBBO, yeah. they honor a 500 share, uh, fill yeah. a 500 share order for that best price. Yeah, it's really interesting. To me, I come back to the Flash Boys thing. Like, to me, this is an important, like, every eight years we go through this, like, you know, public, like, like hand-wringing about, like, our markets. And everyone's like, oh, my God, like, it was like, you know, speed bumps and, you know, and, and Michael Lewis writes this crazy book, 99% of which was just complete nonsense, right? And, and all it did was create more, John Ramsey, I apologize. I know you're in the back of the room. You're a lovely guy. But all it did was create more, like, noise and expense in the marketplace. It didn't really solve anything, right? It was not a problem to be solved. We're going through the exact same thing right now. This is what this is all about, right? Instead of speed bumps and latency arbitrage, it's conflicts and... PFOF and Robinhood and Citadel and meme stocks. And it's just like words. But at the end of the day, when you look, you look under the covers and you look at the system, and you look at the benefits, right? And you're a sensible, non-political person looking at facts and data. You cannot reach a conclusion other than this system is pretty effing good, man. It's pretty effing good. One more topic and we got to narrow the time. Uh, this is why I got my, my, my discussion in up front. But the, uh, the last topic is NBBO. Uh, he did say the current NBBO is getting, we're gonna do a lightning round at the end. Of yeah, this is another conflation point. Yeah, ask the question, I'm sorry, I talked too much. It's a conflation point, go ahead. He said the NBBO is invalid, right, because there's all this off exchange trading. He originally said, oh, the wholesalers have all this information because he didn't know what that the TRF probably existed at the time, right? We don't have information. Everything we execute, we immediately print to the tapes, everybody knows that. Yeah. So the MBBO- I don't need what, to ask the question, go ahead. Don't even ask the question, come on Rich, I love you. But look, The MBBO represents what people are willing to publicly proffer as liquidity. All of us in this room that trade on, an, on a national securities exchange. That's what it is, that's, what, that's all it is. Right? The notion that Virtu, Citadel, and other firms Right? And big banks that are doing big blocks may have other orders, may have an interest that is substantially larger than that what they're willing to post. Right? That's just the fact in every trading market. So is he suggesting that a better MBBO would be, okay, right now, Virtu, our risk limit on Tesla is 37 million, so we're going to post that on a national securities exchange. It's absurd. That's not what the MBBO is. Right? So it, it represents exactly what it says it it represents. If the notion is, well, because wholesalers execute within the MBBO, you're not getting a good indication of real price improvement, there's an answer to that. Congressman Foster from Illinois had, the, had it. He sent a letter. Just measure it off the midpoint. That's how the brokers score us. Right? How close do we get to the midpoint? So the midpoint ain't going to change. Yeah. Whether the MBO is here or the MBBO is here, it's not going to change. So again, it's conflating the issue. It's a red herring. There is a solution for it, right? Put it on the confirm. I don't care. The retail brokers could probably figure out how to do it. They're smart folks. How close did you get to the midpoint? So then you could lay broker A, B, C, D next to each other, and you could decide if that's what's important to you. Are you getting better execution quality from broker A as compared to broker B compared to broker C, right? EQ. Did I answer the question you were going to ask me? Uh, uh, that's EQ. I was going right there, Doug. All right, good. The, uh, I front ran you. I read your mind. <laughs> that happens. We the, don't do that. Either. We don't do that for the record. <laughs> I wish we, we could. We'd make more money, but we can't. We, Joking. We, we got a couple minutes. Like left. latency arbor. Everyone's like, oh my god, latency arbor. I'm like, I wish we could do that. Right? It seems like a good thing. It's not illegal. We never could do it. You, you're cutting it into People my lightning. People do it to us. Yeah. Your lightning round. <laughs> so we have two minutes left. Oh, I just, I, I'm just warning you, Doug. I'm going to give you a, a topic, oh, boy. and if you can give me your first thing that comes to your mind, no longer than one mama. sentence, uh, either a word or one sentence. And I'm also wanting it, some Help of them me, may mama. be- I don't want to get in trouble here, yeah. Some may be market words. structure related, some may be, maybe not. Okay. So uh, first, are you ready? Yes. Retail markets. The best in the world, US, go. 12 billion, billion shares a day. I wish it was more. 37 million contracts per day in options. I wish we could compete better. Jimmy Toes. Great fucking guy. <laughs> great, he's a great fucking guy. Who does, raise your hand if you don't like Jimmy Toast. <laughs> All right. No one raised their hand. Raise your hand if you like Jimmy Toast. All right, there you go. Everybody pay your dues, all right? 
Jimmy Toe's age. Were we a gold sponsor? We were a gold sponsor, right? We were gold, yeah. Jimmy Toe's age. What? 47 and a half. <laughs> Was I oh, close? Okay. Over? Did I win the showcase? Remember Price is Right? You always had a bid low, Jimmy. A dollar! I always loved that guy, the asshole at the end that bid a dollar. Yeah. Remember that guy? And he wasn't going to win both showcases. Remember if you, if you uh, anyhow. I love that show. Equity what Mark. was the name of the guy that was Price is Right guy? Bob Barr guy. Blank for a second, yeah. Equity Mark. He was a good golfer, by the way. You ever see? He was in uh, Bob Barker. He was a good golfer. He was in... Uh, You're confusing me in my lightning Yeah, see? I'm, I'm distracting you. <laughs> is that my brain works? <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> conflating you, Rich. We're conflating. <laughs> you, uh, Google is going to get a Rich big is a demand. great guy, isn't he? Great American. West Pointer, class of 1980. <laughs> Served his country. Helicopter pilot. Well, I'm not bullshitting. This is legit. We love West Pointers at Virtu. My partner, Vinny, was a West Pointer class of 77. We got a bunch of West Pointers that work at Virtu, so God bless them. Honor almost as honorable as Vinny. So uh, nah. last couple, and we'll call, we'll call it quits. Uh, I couldn't do a pull-up, so there's not a chance I could have gotten to West Point. <laughs> I haven't done a pull-up my entire life. You have I tried. You have brain strength, though, yeah. Bill. Yeah. Uh, Doug. Remember, so the, uh, thank you, Rich. That's kind. Equity markets 2023. Not changed too much. Equity markets 2024. A little bit better, but not too much change. Tom Brady. Fuck him. Eli. <laughs> <laughs> that just popped out. I apologize. I'm a life. I was watching the Giants when they played at the Yale Bowl in 1975. That's how crazy my father was. He made us go up there. All right. Yeah. And my daughter goes to Yale, and I went to the game last week. Isn't that cool? Okay. Half Quick. empty. They beat Dartmouth, though. Let's go to Yale. Quickly, quickly. Giselle Bungeon. What? Giselle Bungeon. Who's that? I have no idea. I'm happily married. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Florida Panthers. Uh, Stanley Cup. We open up tomorrow night in the island. Let's go, Panthers. Crypto. I'm excited about it. Talk to Jamil, though. He's much better at this. EDX markets, yeah. Virtu. I love it. My home. That's a wrap. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Rich. <laughs>